All right, we're going to get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Casey Pender, and I'm the National Coordinator of Programs here at the American Liver Foundation. And I'd like to be the first to thank you for joining us for our program today. Today's program is in recognition of Biliary Atresia Awareness Day, which is December 2nd. Today's program will feature a healthcare professional panel, patient and parent panel, and a special guest who will share what it is like to grow up with a sibling who was born with biliary atresia. Before we get started today, I would like to go over some Zoom rules. Today's Life with BA and Beyond webinar series is being delivered on Zoom and will be recorded. We'd really appreciate it if you commute yourself during the program to avoid any disruptions while our speakers present today. If you do have something you want to share or have a question, please utilize the Zoom chat feature or raise your hand and share your thoughts that way. Again, please note that this program is being recorded and will be shared in ALF's private Life of Biliary Atresia and Beyond Facebook group and on our YouTube channel. So for folks who might not want to be on Zoom, please keep your camera off and you can turn it off now. To kick off the forum, we are going to share a reel of all the amazing work the American Liver Foundation has done this past year. We are so proud of the work we have done with this community and we're excited to share it with you. strongly that we have to break down the silos between autoimmune disease and have a greater learning that comes out of it to help patients with an improved quality of life. It requires collaboration from understanding what the frustrations are on our patients' ends. There's industry listening, the FDA is listening as well, and really magnifying your voice to make sure that there's more funding that's given for research and making sure that the outcomes that we're looking at are relevant outcomes for you. Our focus therapeutically should really, I think, be on detection of impending problems and dealing with that. You can sit there in bed and just sulk on what it is that you have and what you want, but if you get up and go, you can do anything. Being active is the best thing I can do for myself. And I want people to know that you can get well. And by partnering with the American Liver Foundation, I get to tell my story. I get to assist other people. I get to be support for other people and let them know you can get well. I am truly grateful for the conversations and the support that I've received from the American Liver Foundation. I don't know where I will be without them. I am so grateful. I am so healthy now. It's unbelievable. I think I was the first patient that they had that was a donor and then was a recipient after that. I am so grateful you are all here because I'm sure you share the same gratitude that I do. Awesome. We just wanted to share that to give you a look into everything we've been doing this year. And I will now introduce our moderator, Dr. Alicia Mavis, who will present our healthcare professional panel. Okay. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I'm sure we'll have some more people join as the evening goes on. Um, so that will be great. But I'm excited to be moderating tonight. We have some co great colleagues of mine that I'll be talking with and asking questions to. Um, just to give you a little introduction into who we have tonight, um, we have Dr. Ricardo Superina, who is the Division Chief of Transplant Compatibility Surgery at Ann and Lori, 
Ann and Robert H. Lurie's Children's Hospital Chicago, um, and he is also the chair in transplantation there, and I previously worked with him and trained under him, so that is wonderful. We also have Dr. Georgie Bezzera, who is the Robert L. Moore Chair Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UT Southwestern Medical Center and also the pediatric Pediatrician in Chief at Children's Medical Center of Dallas. And is Georgie on? I didn't see Georgie yet. If not, Dr. Ballester, we may come to use for some of those questions because I see that you're on. Um, and then we also have Kevin Jacobson, who's a transplant social worker for GI Hepatology and Nutrition at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. So I just want to start by saying thank you guys for joining us. I greatly appreciate your time and effort for doing this. Um, we just are going to do a little Q&A tonight where I have some questions that were submitted ahead of time that I'll go through first. If anyone has any questions, please let us know what they are, please put them in the chat and we'll be happy to um, get to them. Also, if you would like to unmute yourself to ask a question, that works as well. Um, Casey and Ivory will be helping monitor the chat so we make sure we get through everyone's questions. So just to start for Dr. Sabrina, Kevin and Dr. Bezzera, if you're on here, if not, Dr. Ballesteri is on here. He is also a well-known pediatric hepatologist in the field. Um, who looks like he's joining tonight too. I'm starting him on the spot, so he may not want to talk. But just a question for everyone to start with. What updates have y'all seen in biliary atresia within the last three years? And Rick and Kevin, y'all are both muted. Uh, I'm sorry, Alicia, could you repeat the question? What updates have you guys seen in biliary atresia in the last three, three to five years? Well, if 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 I can go first, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of things that are in the works for biliary atresia. There's a lot of new thoughts, you know, particularly about the prevention of fibrosis after a Kasai operation. But my main interest is actually trying to address the issue that the operation for biliary atresia doesn't really have a great success rate. And most of these children end up needing a transplant at some point sooner or later. And unfortunately, a large number of them end up getting a transplant in the first year or two of life. And I would I mean, trying to figure out uh, with colleagues from Europe and South America to try to come up with a system of trying to um, discover or try to predict the outcome of this operation so that it's not done in a futile manner and that we can go straight to a primary transplant if that's ultimately the, the best solution for half the children within the first two or three years of life. Oh, that's a great point and a great thing to be trying to work on and focus on. Um, Kevin, do you have anything from the social work side or resource side? Um, so not a ton has changed, um, from my, from my field of work. Um, I've been doing transplant social work for probably about 10 years in pediatrics and, uh, all of that time in liver. And I would say about half of every, of my caseload in liver transplant are, uh, biliary atresia children, usually under the age of two or three who have gone through the, the Kasai and the, the surgeries that have ultimately um, failed and need, needing a transplant. Um, and then later we can talk about some more of the resources specific to transplant and things that we generally do for all of our patients. Wonderful. And Dr. Ballesteri has agreed to work, answer some questions. So Dr. Ballesteri, any yes. See, thank, thank you for jumping in and letting us put you on the spot. Oh, it's always fun to talk about uh, the progress that's being made in this exciting field. The key, I think, to us is early diagnosis. And there are several new strategies that are being used uh, around the uh, world. And that is uh, different blood tests that uh, have been developed, uh, some by Dr. Bezerra, who was here in Cincinnati, and uh, Dr. Uh, Harvavath in Houston. So I think that's the key because if Dr. Superina wants great outcomes from his biliary atresia Kasai procedure, he's gonna to wanna to see these children early. I assume uh, I speak for you, Rick, but I assume you agree. 
Uh, there's no, absolutely no, I'm sorry, I'm going to move to a, a quieter area. I totally agree with that, Bill. And, you know, unfortunately, the median age at which these children come to our attention is usually anywhere between 60 to 70 days of age. 56 days of age seems to be sort of the time. And, you know, when we see them at that point, about half of them will ultimately fail. And there are some predictors of failure, but I think in general, I would agree with you that those who are diagnosed before 30 days of age and have their operation before 30 days of age seem to have a better outcome. And we, so we clearly, yeah, and we clearly have work to do because there are still some major social, uh, socioeconomic uh, differences in the, the rate at which patients are diagnosed. So that should be a major initiative uh, for all of us, uh, all citizens, all physicians, all healthcare providers. Very good point, gentlemen. Um, so, Dr. Ballesteri, I'm going to keep you on the spot for this next one. Besides surgery that we're going to ask Dr. Superina about in a little bit more detail in just a second, any other treatments for biliary atresia at this time or anything really on the horizon? Since I think I know what you're going to say for the current time. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, like any other problem, the first step is defining what is the mechanism. And I think we've learned after studying this disease, I think between Dr. Superina and I close to 90 years, uh, with with me the bulk of that uh, we we aren't much closer uh, to the cause. It is probably multifactorial. Uh, we everyone has looked for genetic causes, viral causes, immunologic causes. So no, the answer is uh, the best option is early diagnosis and get them into the hands of a, a expert surgeon such as Dr. Superina. Thank you. And on to you, Dr. Superina, what do you, what do you kind of see after surgery for these patients? Um, you kind of got into the earlier diagnosis has better outcomes, but how does it kind of go post-surgery for these patients and what are some things you're looking for? Well, you know, at the time of surgery, we do the cholangiogram. That's, that's the first thing we do, obviously. There, from a diagnostic point of view, I think the interoperative cholangiogram remains the, probably the best single um, test that, that will prove or disprove. Biopsies, as you know, can be somewhat misleading. Um, so we do the, uh, you know, one of the things I would like to see more of, just as a, I'm putting in a little plug here for my own, you know, soapbox views is that unfortunately in this country, there is no centralization of care for the little trees. And I, I think Bill might actually agree to that. You know, anybody can do the Kasai. There's nobody that says, no, you know, there's no center that's saying, oh, you know, we don't do enough of these. We should send them to a center that does more. In England, where there are three centers that do all the Kasai for 80 million people, they have diagnostic uh, acumen that we don't have. Um, in the sense that not all these cases get get cholangiograms, but I sort of digress a little bit. So I mean, the cholangiogram can be somewhat predictive. If you have the so-called correctable atresia, you know you're going to have a good result. If you have a nodular liver, then it becomes a question of whether or not you should do the Kasai at all. But then when you do the operation, sometimes you'll see bile, and that's a good sign. But in general, at the end of the operation, when I talk to the parents, unfortunately, I can't really tell them much more than we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Uh, and, you know, we've all agreed that maybe in a 90 day period is reasonable to wait. I've seen some cases where after 90 days, there is some, you know, magical <clears throat> drainage of bile happening when there wasn't anything before. But I think we would generally agree that by three months, if you're not draining, you're going to have to probably start that trip down the road to transplant. Um, you know, we know that the biliary atresia splenic malformation syndrome probably has has poorer results. Um, the incidence of that in the United States is higher than that in Japan, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, it points to that multifactorial cause that uh, Bill talked about. Um so at the end of the day, we're, what are the prognostic features? Early diagnosis, bile at the time of surgery, what the OHI classification would 
call the correctable atresias, which are the type ones. And um, if the bile, if the bilirubin comes down to near normal by three months of age, that augurs very well for the patient. Thank you. That was extremely helpful and detailed. Now, Kevin, on to you. So you just heard we don't have any other treatments for surgery. If surgery is not early, it's more problematic, but also Dr. Superina can't get the family any prognosis when he walks out of the OR. So how is it, how do we help support families and kind of what do families go through in those weeks, months after the side procedure, you know, as they're working through all this? What are some of the things they're thinking about? Yeah, well, um, one of the major components to any um, success, I think, in healthcare, but especially in transplant, is uh, kind of leveraging a patient and family's support system to help surround them and essentially take off any burden that can be unloaded from parents and children um, and offloaded to, to somebody else. So that can be very concrete things like... Uh, getting laundry done, meals, uh, running errands, uh, helping with bills, like all the concrete uh, kind of necessities of living, um, any amount of that that we can take away from a family and offload to their support system or to any kind of uh, support program, uh, I think directly impacts the, the parents and children and allows them to be more present uh, both in the immediate days after surgery and within the, that first year or two um, after transplant. Um, so that looks different for every family and it looks different for kind of every step in that first year. Um, immediately after the, the surgery, I'm mostly meeting with uh, families in the ICU and in the, the patient room, trying to make sure that they have, you know, five minutes of space to themselves where they can uh, breathe, talk to their, you know, mom and dad, talk to their other children. I try to create any sense of normal rhythm within an inherently um, unpredictable environment. Um, trying to keep things quiet and promote healing, uh, essentially, for, for that first uh, index hospitalization. Um, and then as things become more stable as we hone in on the correct levels of immunosuppression for each child. And uh, we start to see them return to like some, you know, youthful uh, exuberance. Then we can start looking forward into more uh, fun things like connecting with Make-A-Wish, planning for uh, events out in the community and some of the, um, I don't know, light at the end of the tunnel sorts of things for, for kids and families. Um, and that's a really nice transition point. Um, usually between month six and 12 after the tra transplant, as we're getting really um, kind of solid on our immunosuppression. Yeah, Kevin, uh, I wonder if I might add, uh, I, what I would love to do is to set the tone and that is the tone of optimism. Mm -hmm. You know, because they hear this is a disease that we, as Dr. Mavis just brought out, we don't have medical therapy. But uh, I've been around long enough, and as Rick, that uh, we went from a 95% mortality rate for biliary atresia before Dr. Kasai's uh, procedure was adopted by uh, the Toronto group with Rick, uh, Cincinnati, Chicago. And now we're talking about a 95% survival rate. So we've gone flip the coin totally, 95% mortality, 95% survival. So I think we need to set the tone, give them optimism so that they enter that phase that you just talked about with that uh, with that uh, outlook so that they can attack uh, the, the task. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. B, that's a really great point. Um, and, that, and that's where it comes into identifying that every family is a little bit different. Um, some folks need uh, a little more cheerleading at the beginning um, and that optimistic support. And then there are other families where what they need is space to grieve the, the path of life that they thought they would be on. Um, and so that's where um, kind of 
adapting your therapeutic approach, um, at least from the psychosocial perspective, becomes really important in finding out what is uh, the most supportive and most helpful for each individual uh, family and child. Thank you both. That is very helpful. And I think that's very helpful for the families to hear. Um, every family handles this situation differently and works through it differently. And so trying to help find that spot for that family is very important. Um, a new question that came in for anyone that wants to answer, are there any studies that show any negative effects from COVID-19 on children under five with biliary atresia? I know it's very specific. Yeah. Well, we follow that literature very closely. Uh, first of all, because it's easier to collect in the four-year data than 50-year data that I've just been referring to. And uh, there's no question that if a patient is significantly uh, immune suppressed, either with medication or because of malnutrition, they might have a little bit of a rougher course. Uh, and that applies also to the post-transplant population. But the bottom line is, not a significant difference. That does not mean that we should not take this virus serious. It's still here and that we shouldn't get vaccinated and do all the other isolation procedures that are necessary. Thank you. And just to um, reiterate that, we do as a community recommend that these patients get vaccinated, um, whether they have biliary atresia and going to liver transplant, actually doing well close to side and not needing transplant this time. And it is our community's recommendation. I know that had come up in a question too. Um, what is, I know we were kind of talking about differences in countries, but what is the prevalence of biliary atresia here in the US and kind of what is it globally or in some of the other more prominent countries? Well, Mark, Mark Davenport and I have just, uh wrote and written a review article that's going to be published in Journal of Pediatric Surgery, hopefully in the next couple of months, where in the United States, it's generally thought to be about 1 in 18,000 live births. But there are countries like Japan and China, where the incidence is at least twice that much. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Balistrieri uh, has more to add on that. I think there's a super high incidence in some of the Pacific Islands, like Fiji, where the, the incidence is even higher. Um, and the, the, the problem is, you know, diagnosing those. So one in 18,000 live births is not a lot, but um, it adds up to about 500 new cases a year in the United States. Yeah, and I think and I, uh, you go ahead, Rick. And I sort of, I, I sort of feel sorry for the pediatrician, you know, who, you always sort of feel like, oh, my God, this guy missed a diagnosis. But if you're seeing all these kids in your entire career, how many children with biliary atresia are you going to see compared to those you see with physiological jaundice? I think it's like a needle in a haystack. So it's no wonder that some of the diagnoses are made late. Yeah, I, th I agree. And I think one of the difficulties is there is no discrete endpoint for saying this patient has biliary atresia. I mean, clearly, Dr. Superina in the operating room can tell us very clearly, but a number of patients are referred with jaundice, and they are labeled as biliary atresia because it's always the top of everybody's list. But they may well have had other metabolic uh, inborn errors uh, that uh, disrupt bile flow. That leads us right into our next question, and I think that back about the we're going to keep you, but I think Georgie's joined us too, so... We have more expertise on the line. Um, thank you, Jordy, Jordy, for joining us. Um, so kind of one that you were going down, Dr. Bellisteri, is, you know, parents concerned that if their child has jaundice, why aren't tests being done to rule out biliary atresia? Or why aren't they done sooner? Why do they not make it to the operating room sooner? Or what are other things that may mimic biliary atresia, you know, when they present with cholestasis or jaundice? I'd be happy to defer to Dr. Bezerra uh, because I'm I'm really just the guest, uh, but uh, I would be happy to add <clears throat> two thoughts. Uh, I love the question of why aren't the tests done at birth because there now is emerging data that that may well be a, a disease that could be recognized at least in a proportion of patients very early in life. 
I think the problem is that uh, many primary care physicians are used to seeing babies that are jaundiced for other reasons, physiologic jaundice, breast milk jaundice, you know, all, all babies get jaundice. It's the j baby with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia that needs early recognition and definition. Georgie, I apologize. Dr. Balisre, uh, Dr. Mavis, uh, and you all, it's such a privilege and an honor to uh, join you. I'm so sorry that I'm joining almost a half an hour late. I also want to, to tell you that when you have Dr. Balistrieri and Dr. Superina as part of a discussion, I learned very well that what I should do is be quiet. But I also like to listen to Dr. Balistrieri. If he asks me a question, I'm supposed to say something. So let me first share with you that my perspective with uh, about biliary atresia is that it is a disease that is on the way to be tamed. It's a matter of time and we will have powerful tools to knock it down. Final ways to bring hope to the parents of the babies with biliary atresia. So as it relates specifically for the challenge that pediatricians and parents have, and they see so many babies with biliary, uh, with jaundice, and they say, when do I need to worry? I, rem I always remind my, my colleagues, myself first, and then everybody around me, that the Academy of Pediatrics suggests that any baby with biliary, with jaundice, at or after two weeks of age should have a uh, fractionation of the bilirubin. So it has the same bilirubin level, but the tests need to be done as direct and total. I do not know if you already talked about this, Dr. B and Dr. Superina, or even you may. No. It's a simple message to parents and pediatricians. Academy of Pediatrics already recommended that any baby with jaundice, healthy, even healthy looking babies, they need to have bilirubin test done to fractionate because the few babies that have an increase in the direct bilirubin should be promptly evaluated. A simple message, big hope because at two weeks of age, if the disease is starting, we can diagnose and get the magical hands of surgeons like Dr. Superinas to go in, do that cholangiogram inside the operating room. And if the baby has biliary atresia, treat it right there. The earlier, the better. So I do hope that, as Dr. Balistrieri said, that in the future, since we are pretty convinced, I think very strong data from our colleagues here in Texas, in Houston, that show that almost all babies, if not all of them, have already an increase in that direct bilirubin at birth or in the first two days of birth, we may be able to screen but I think we collectively can continue to work to see if that's possible for the future and how to do it. Thank you, Georgie. That was Dr. Zara, excuse me. George is fine. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That's very helpful and it's a great message. And I know we're working hard to get that out there to all pediatricians too. Um, I wanted to ask Kevin a question that's come up. So. Kevin, for, are there any resources, financial resources, or other resources available for families as they're going through this and through the surgery and things like housing assistance, helping with bills? Are there any kind of national resources that families can go through? Because the diagnosis of biliary atresia alone is difficult, and if they immediately go to transplant, it's even, it's, it's just as hard. Yeah. Um, so for, uh, specifically for transplant, um, there are a few things I try to connect families with. Um, 
one of the very first is an organization called the Children's Organ Transplant Association, uh, CODA. Uh, they are a nonprofit that their mission is to help run crowdfunding style fundraisers. So think of a GoFundMe, something uh, akin to that, specifically for transplant related expenses and transplant families. Um, one of the reasons I really advocate for our families to get connected with these uh, is one, a hundred percent of any money raised uh, goes towards the child and their care. There's no administrative costs taken out. There's nothing off the top that goes to CODA to, to manage the account. Um, two, come tax season, it's not counted as income, which for some of our families who rely on Medicaid and public assistance is very important um, because we have had instances where very well-intentioned uh, family members and communities have started to go fund me to, to support transplant related expenses only to find out the very next year that made them ineligible for their Medicaid because they were suddenly over-resourced because that gets counted as an income. Um, another thing that is very helpful from CODA is they're active in uh, all 50 states and have a really good pulse on local grants that are available depending on even where a patient lives. Um, I've had families that come from small counties in Indiana that find out they're eligible for a free $5,000 grant or $10,000 grant specifically from that county that's been set up for medical expenses. Um, and CODA is very good at finding and identifying those. Um, and to go back to one of the things that I mentioned about kind of removing the burden of transplant off of the, the parents and direct caregivers is their model is to try to identify a person in their community, um, a aunt, uncle, grandparent, close family friend, uh, someone from a faith community that they're involved with that wants to, to be like the organizer and plan fundraisers and essentially take over that part of their care so that parents can focus on, on their children. Um, I found that to be one of the best supports because that money can then be used for loss of income uh, when parents are in the hospital for weeks on end, can be used for travel expenses, um, flights to and from the transplant center, gas to, to the labs, because like these expenses add up. Um, as well as you know, any copay that comes, any medical related expense is, is a no brainer. Um, but even if you rely on a piece of technology, um, some of our kids rely on uh, smartphones or tablets to monitor their healthcare. If that breaks, um, needing that replaced is a healthcare expense. And that's something that the code of money can be used for. Um, outside of that, uh, I generally try to leverage uh, folks insurance and their their Medicaid and what they're uh, available for. And then also um, their employers, um, depending where folks have, have worked, uh, having matching gifts for fundraising or um, even extended time away or extended leave with pay. Um, as long as you're advocating with the HR department and getting connected with the right people, um, I found that having a letter from a hospital can go a long way and kind of... Um, encouraging people to be more supportive. Um, but other than that, um, since we get people from all over the country, uh, a large part of my, my job then is trying to find out what is available in, you know, North Dakota or California or Arizona that uh, our families may qualify for. That was extremely helpful. Um, I think I learned some things there that I didn't know that I could maybe help families with. That was great. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, one more question for Dr. Sabrina, Dr. Bezerra, and Dr. Balistrieri. Now, I know this next question we could spend a good three, four, or five hours on, so we got to keep it brief. We only have about, you know, five to ten minutes left here. So, a couple of things on research. A, parents wondering how do they get their child in the research study and what kind of things are out there right now. And another one that was asked about research was, any research being done on the adult side, on the mother's side of women that have um, pregnancies that end up with having a child with biliary treasure, are we looking at the pregnancy side of things just in addition to the pediatric side? I know that's kind of a two-pronged question, but Dr. Rosario, you want to start? 
So I'll be glad to uh, start. Uh, I think that first and the second question about the parents, the mothers, it is quite a bit of data that uh, different investigators are getting on maternal history of babies that have biliary atresia. One of the national uh, study groups called the Childhood Liver Disease Research Network has looked at that very consistently. To date, informally speaking, there's been no specific pattern about the pregnancy of the mother that has emerged that could make us a link with biliary atresia. Perhaps I can stop here and see if Dr. Balistrieri and Dr. Superina have more to add. I, I will only add, Georgie, thank you, that uh, one of the concerns that I'm sure parents have is what did I do wrong? And uh, I can, after, 50 years of caring for this disease, I can say unequivocally that I don't know of any link between what the parents uh, have done or do or, or have that leads to the children having biliary atresia. In fact, I have five sets of twins in which one has biliary atresia and the other has a totally normal liver, two of which, two sets of which are identical. So riddle me that. Well said, Dr. B. I, I, uh, I just have the experience where I had one set of children, uh, twins, fraternal twins, and they both had biliotresia. Uh, so not identical, same mother, of course, but, uh, one born, you know, five minutes after the other, both had biliotresia. So it spoke to me that there must be some environmental factor or some intrauterine thing that happened to have both of these children who were genetically similar, but not identical, both had baby and trees. I, I don't do a lot of a basic science research uh, in the trees, but I do a lot of outcome studies, trying to sort of figure out the patterns of who will do well after the Kasai, and that becomes a, a, a major uh, problem, because as a surgeon, I think I, I said at the beginning, Georgia, you weren't, you didn't hear this. It was extremely frustrating to have a failure rate as high for a Kasai procedure. Nowhere else in surgery do we accept that we're going to have um, a failure rate of 40%. Um, and most of our, a lot of our patients will end up needing another operation. And I think it's, uh, you know, I've spoken to some of the parents uh, in, in <clears throat> uh, the Billy uh Research Consortium about how painful it is to go through an operation and not really know the outcome and and how to how to face this kind of you know mystery where you have to wait for so long to figure out if the results are going to be good or not and it would behoove us all to try to sort of come up with a with an answer for these parents not that it's easy to come up with and i remain so optimistic that you're going to do it we working as teams and with families, community <clears throat> leaders, we're going to do it. As it relates to biliary atresia trials, uh, there are uh, a couple of trials that uh, if families want and they need to know, six centers that have uh, the studies on going and enroll. And these are trials that the, the, uh, the investigators are using a molecule that prevents bile acids from being reabsorbed, so they are excreted in the stools. So as the bile acids are excreted in the stools, there is less bile acid that accumulates in the liver, thus decreasing the injury that bile acid can cause, the excessive bile acid can cause. Um, so several centers uh, are enrolling patients into that trial, but perhaps a main message is go to clinicaltrials.gov and you will see a list there are perhaps only two, two classes in the United States of a medication that are being trialed. One is, as I mentioned to you, this inhibitor, myelixibat or the vixibat, and the other one is, is the two names for the same medication or similar medication. And the other one is a, 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 a GCSF, or a, 
a, a, um, a cytokine-like molecule that is given to this baby. It's only being, I think, only accepting patients in uh, Washington, D.C., I think. It's only one center. Perhaps uh, you know of others. That was wonderful. This has been a delight for me because you guys are all my mentors. But one last question and make it very brief because we have less than a minute to go. And Kevin, I want you to join in on this one. What's one takeaway you share with families as you're going through this process, working with families, or one one last piece of advice you would give them? Dr. Sabrina, you're muted if you're going. I was coughing a lot, so I thought I'd spare you all the coughing. Um, I think that uh, I echo the optimism that uh, Georgie talked about because no matter what the outcome of the Kasai is, you know that these kids are going to be end up end up fine. Whether it's with uh, new drugs that are going to prevent fibrosis, and you know, lengthen the amount of time that you're going to be surviving with your native liver, or whether you need a transplant. The survival rate now for transplants in babies with diabetes is above ninety five percent, and you know, we catch them early enough, have an aggressive way of treating them, they're going to do fine. So I think. You know, if you look at the survival curves for biliatresia, overall survival, it's really, it's really pretty good. I mean, I would say that it's, I mean, I would, 95% is probably about the, the right number. So it's optimism. No matter what you've got, you're going to be able to get your kid through this. Wonderful. Dr. Lazaro? Life is stronger than biliatresia. Dr. Superina said they're right. Either with the Kasai or with the transplant. Uh, your, uh, let's work together to make sure that your child your child can grow to be smarter than you, more successful than you. That's what we all want. I love it. Dr. Balasari? Yeah, to, to, to play on what Georgie talked about, I think we're all in this together. Everybody says biliary atresia is a rare disease, but everybody on this line has, has somebody with biliary atresia. So you need to get out there and emphasize, be be raise the awareness and be an advocate for not only the biliary atresia, but the American Liver Foundation. We Good need hope. everybody. I agree with that 100%. Um, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, it, it really is a message of optimism. Um, it's incredible to look back over a calendar year and see how much can change, um, especially in the world of transplant and going from being in the hospital to having a vibrant child running around and behaving like any toddler or, you know, grade school teenager might be. Um, so my message would be that there is a vibrant life available to our families and patients and a really wonderful community in both biliary atresia and transplant through the American Liver Foundation and various other, even just local organizations and your hospital. Like, I think there's, yeah, great life to be had. Well, I echo all of those final thoughts as a pediatric hepatologist, but I would just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time, Kevin, Dr. Bezzera, Dr. Sabrina, Dr. Ballesteri, for being a last minute jump in for us. We greatly appreciate it. It's been so nice to have you guys answering questions. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor to be able to moderate this session. So at this time, I'll hand it back to Casey um, and continue on. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. B, for jumping in. He wasn't even supposed to be on this panel, and we really, really appreciate him. So our next panel is our special guest panel, and it's featuring Lexi and her mom, Stephanie. Lexi grew up with a sister who has biliary atresia and had a transplant. We are hardly ever hear about BA from the sibling perspectives, and it's so important to hear how your children might be affected by this disease. So Lexi, can you just take a minute to share about your story, please? So she was diagnosed 2013 in what month? June. June. That's right, your anniversary. She was diagnosed on her 10 year wedding anniversary. And from the beginning, all of our kids were very aware of what was happening. Lexi was our oldest. Um, she was four at diagnosis and five at transplant. 
Um, and our next child was three and then a two-year-old and then Sophia. Yes. Sophia instantly had her Kasai at diagnosis um, and she was diagnosed later. She was diagnosed a little over three months. So hers was instantly a fail. So Lexi, did you like knowing what was going on with your sister and how your parents handled that and keeping you involved? It was really scary, but they were really open about it. So it made us feel comfortable to be able to ask questions. Good. That is so important. It's so important for you to feel safe in that space because there's so many unknowns at the time. And if you have a question, but your parents weren't there to answer it, it could just make you think of all these other bad things that could be happening. So that's so amazing. Mm -hmm. What was one special thing that your parents did at this time to try to keep life a little bit normal? So we would do movie nights where we would order out or bake something and then we'd all gather up and watch a movie or we'd do a brownie night. So we'd stay in and bake brownies and just all eat brownies. That is so fun. And you like that? You liked having that special time and that normalcy in this chaotic yeah. time? Mm -hmm. Good. So Stephanie, if you could give one piece of advice to parents who have multiple children and who need to focus on that young child who is sick, what would that advice be? My biggest piece of advice is, like Lexi touched on before, to be open with your kids. Um, it was scary for my husband and I, but we tried to put ourselves in our other kids' shoes and process. Their sister is sick. Mom and dad are upset. Grandparents and family and friends are upset. What was going on in their world? So we tried to be open and honest with them at their level, but still be open and honest and be available to communicate. And if it meant sitting down and coloring and just talking casually or all sitting down as a family, we tried to take those moments and also keep normalcy in our life. It was a crazy busy time, but we tried to keep things normal so they didn't feel like their entire world was turned upside down. Yes, that's amazing. And it sounds like it helped. It really did. So Lexi, if you could give one piece of advice to maybe some other kids who their siblings are sick, what would that be? I would say do like fun stuff and try and keep it as normal as possible, but also keep the reality that this is happening and it's scary, but you got to keep pushing through. The show must go on. Yeah. You have such a mature perspective on the whole situation. And Lexi's only 14, right? 15. 15. Just turned 15. So it's just so amazing to see how she went through something so terrible at such a young age. But you're so mature and you're so open and it's just so wonderful to see. And we are so lucky to have you on. And if you guys would like to stay on for your next for the next panel too, feel free. And if anyone has any questions for Lexi, in the chat, we're just seeing some love for you in the chat, but we really, really appreciate you today and all this time you spent with us. Thank you for having us. Of course. All right, so we are actually going to now move on to our next panel, and I am going to hand it over to Liz to moderate. Liz is yeah. part of our ALF board and she's part of the Bear Foundation, and she actually helped create Billy Ari Juja Awareness Day. So if Liz, you want to share a moment for your story, and then we could go right into our next panel. Hi, so can you hear me? All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. And uh, I think our story is very similar to everybody else's here on the line. It's, uh, you know, we we went to the pediatrician at eight weeks and he felt terrible because he missed, you know, he felt he missed something. And then we ended up at children's hospital in St. Louis and uh, it, it just continued, right? It was one of those journeys where you put one foot in front of the other and you, you work through it. And um, so by eight weeks old, he had his Kasai by five months old. Uh, our Kasai was a fail. And so Alex received a sliver of my liver 17 years ago. 
in January, in, uh, in actually January, we're coming up to 18 years post transplant. So he is doing amazing right now. He is currently a junior in high school. He's a National Honor Society member. And um, overall health and wellness is, is key, and he's been doing great. We've, we've just stayed the course. So thank you for having me, um, and, and welcome. Let's see. So with that, I have the pleasure to introduce some of the parents <laughs> and patients that we have on the line for uh, our parent-patient panel. So first, I'd like to introduce a couple of the patients. So we have Jeffrey Doerr and uh, Ginny Tice. And so with that, I also have parents here. I have Beth, oh, I'm gonna try really hard to say this correctly, Rosensky, and then Jordan Sarba. So welcome to all of you, thank you. So with that, I wanna get started with the, uh, with the patients tonight. So Jeffrey, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Starting us off, I would love if you would share your story a bit about you and uh, how you're doing. Sure. Well, thank you, Liz, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight and, and share my story. Um, so normally you'll introduce yourself with age, but I think in this this context, I think it's important to. So uh, 38 years old, uh, I, I'm 10 years into a uh, liver transplant. I celebrated my 10th anniversary this year uh, by going to Patagonia. And uh, I have two kids. And uh, if you're doing the math, uh, that means I made it to 28 with uh, my, my native liver. So um, pretty unique in that circumstance and pretty fortunate. I, like to, I don't know if this is bragging or not, uh, but I, I like to think that I'm the luckiest unlucky person uh, on the face of the planet. So um you know, it, heck of a journey for sure, but um, have always found a way to find my normalcy in, in all of this. Well, thank you. And congratulations. I knew about one. I didn't know about two. So yes. very nice. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yeah. And just so everyone knows, Jeffrey's father serves on the national board with me. So Alan Dorr. And so uh, thank you for joining Next, I would love to hear the story of Jenny and find out, you know, how she was and how she did sure. as a patient. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I would actually really resonate with, I feel like I'm the un, uh, the luckiest unlucky person <laughs> that I've met. I was transplanted at eight months old and I've had, um, I'm celebrating, uh, it'll be 35 years post-transplant in February of next year. Um so I live and work in San Francisco, and um, I didn't speak much about biliary atresia or my transplant until I turned about 30 years old. So this is all new for me. I'm navigating, learning how to balance being a patient and uh, being a professional and um, being an advocate um, and um, celebrating what it is to uh, have such a wonderful gift. So, um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And my gosh, I, I love hearing the ages because of as a parent, right? That just gives me such great hope that, oh my gosh, okay, we got to 17. We're definitely getting to 35. So, <laughs> all right. Next, I'd like to hear a little bit about the parent story. So we've got Beth. Turn that over to Beth. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Hi, I'm the mom um, of Callum, who just celebrated his four-year liver anniversary. He was diagnosed um, in 2018. Um, he actually had a very quick diagnosis. I don't know if that um, sounds like in this case might not be so normal, um, but was his because I was at 30, 30 days old and then transplanted at 10 months. And yeah, now he's a vibrant five-year-old. I love it. Thank you so much. And then Jordan. Hi, Beth. I'm, I think I'm similar to you where uh, we were actually diagnosed pretty quickly as well. Um, so we were in a situation where at 20 weeks, um, we, my son was diagnosed with heterotaxy. And so we knew that immediately, you know, when he was going to be born, he was going to go to the NICU 
And so within days, we knew that he had polysplenia and situs inversus, which, you know, flip of the organs. Um, <clears throat> so we knew that stuff was going on. Um, so he was actually diagnosed pretty early, about two weeks. But then he didn't have his Kasai until about um, 45 days. Um, and he's six and a half years post-transplant. Um, he's seven years old and just has the energy that I am jealous of <laughs> and doing so well. Thank you, appreciate that. All right, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and transfer over to our Q&A session. And so with that, I have a few questions that have come in ahead of time. And um, I'm gonna start, first of all, with uh, the patients. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand, put them in the chat window, and we'll, uh, we'll come around to you. I would love if anyone would want to come off of mute and ask a question direct, that's fine as well. Just raise your hand and we'll get there. So with that, as far as the patients are concerned, so Jeffrey or Jenny, um, so many patients and parents are afraid that they cannot live a normal life post-transplant. Do you feel that you have lived a normal life and, have conti and are continuing to live a normal life? Um, uh, 100%, uh, normal life. I mean, aside from, uh, the experiences, uh, that I have. And, and I think as you get older, you learn how to leverage, or you realize the uniqueness of your experiences and how you can channel them into your superpowers of like, for example, resiliency. Um, and, uh, so yeah, aside from the obvious and, the uh, upkeep of medical care and, and so forth, which is relatively speaking minimal, especially uh, if there's a silver lining to all this as a patient is, you know, to hear the parents and, and, you know, having heard these stories many times over the years, I don't remember anything, you know, <laughs> that's, that's probably the best part of all this is this really traumatic and anxiety provoking uh, scenario that, or this experience that the parents have, the kids don't really have that in the early days and you grow up with liver disease as your normal with biliary atresia as your normal and then when you get transplanted that's your normal so um, it's it's um like anything you can you can find the opportunity in it and and leverage it well, yeah thank you um thank hey, you Jenny. um jeff um well said um i think perspective is uh, really powerful. Um, and also the world, the word normal is, I mean, what is normal, right? <laughs> it's uh, all I, I knew. I uh, had to take medication. I had to go to the doctors more. I had to get lab work, but that was my normal. Uh, that was my perspective. Um, you know, looking back on the past 35 years, you know, I've been able to accomplish so much, travel the world, run half marathons, uh, achieve things much greater than, you know, perhaps in 1988, uh, my care team perhaps thought that I could. So um, normal, yes, challenging sometimes, um, but wonderful and vibrant, absolutely. Um, if anything, I feel that it um, helps me have a um, a greater incentive to take really good care of myself. Um, and that is part of my normal, um, take on what I can take on, um, you know, do the minimum, drink water, exercise, um, go to my appointments. And, uh, I recently out of curiosity looked up, uh, what percent of the U S population is, uh, living with some type of chronic illness. And it's actually much, much higher than I had expected. I believe it was somewhere around 50%. So I think, you know, everyone mm -hmm. has something, um, uh, yes, very unlucky, <laughs> um, but you know, you just have to take it one step at a time. So normal, yes, but my normal, so. Well, thank you both. I, I love hearing the perspective from that, you know, the, the patient side. I always wonder what my son thinks and feels as he's going through his doctor's visits and all of that. So thank you. And I, I think it is the same with Alex. It's his normal. So uh, thank you. All right. I am going to ask a couple of questions to the parents on the line. So Beth and Jordan, uh, what is the best piece of advice that you can share to parents? 
Um, I think early on, one of my favorite people on our liver team um, reminded me that it is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and just taking it one day at, at a time. If every time there's something that comes up, you think about all of the possibilities that could happen from that one set of labs or that one result or whatever it is, you're going to be overwhelmed constantly. Um, and even everyone's biliary atresia journey, as we have been seeing from so many uh, folks here, everyone's journey is so different. Um, so just taking it one day at a time and um, really enjoying your kid. That was the other uh, piece of advice early on that a doctor, you know, my baby was four days old and that was the first time I heard the words biliary atresia and I distraught I was like God, no I don't want it I don't want to do that um and the doctor before we left the hospital that day he said this is the only time you're going to have a four day so don't don't miss it don't um you know spend it just wallowing enjoy every second um and I still do that he's five and I still enjoy every second even if we're at the hospital even if we're getting labs I enjoy mm -hmm. every second with him because uh billy retreated kids are just the best they're so resilient they're so amazing um and I am really lucky that he's he's my guy there you go and I, love I, I think that's advice is absolutely spot on um I, I think that that would be in my top three um, I think for me, it was, um, it, it kind of goes off of yours, Beth. It's that comparison is the thief of joy. So you don't, you can't compare your journey, what's going on with your child, with what's going on with your friends, children, your other siblings, um, just society in general, because that's really going to rob you of any happiness and you really need to find a way to celebrate those little victories, kind of like what Beth was saying, um, live in that moment. Um, but that overarching comment of comparison is just going to drive you nuts. So don't try to compare yourself or your child to anyone else. Great bit of advice, great bit of advice. We uh, we used to have the motto and mantra of keep on keeping on. And so one foot in front of the, bit, <laughs> the other and every day just chugging away. So I appreciate that. Did I see a hand up in the chat window? I wasn't sure if I saw that or if I saw a wave or a... Ivory and uh, Casey, you got to... Help me out with that one. So if you catch anybody that has any questions or if there are any in the chat, I'd appreciate a little help catching those. So Beth and Jordan, as uh, as parents, what do you think was the hardest obstacle to face post-transplant? And you know what, Jeffrey, you had your transplant a little later in life. And so, yeah, I guess if you'd like to weigh in too with what was the hardest obstacle right at transplant, post-transplant? Jeffrey, if you want to think about it, or Beth, if you want to think about it, I can jump in. I think that my, the hardest thing for me immediately post-transplant was relearning my child. So my child was a completely different child post-transplant. I was so used to the medical um, charting, or I was so used to kind of medical mode and survival mode with everything that... Um, I didn't know, like I had to relearn his cues. I had to relearn if this was um, just normal sick or if this was liver sick. Um, I had to relearn some of his behaviors. Like all of a sudden he had energy or he was having fits and he was acting out, which Hudson's my only child. So I had to have people remind me like, this is normal. Like <laughs> A toddler being a jerk is, is a toddler. It's not, that's not uh, something that's specific. So that was really a challenge for me is I essentially had to, you know, I have pre-transplant Hudson and then I have post-transplant Hudson and they are two different kids. And it was almost like, you know, I think every mother, every parent can, you, know, you get to know, like, you don't know your baby right away. It takes time to get to know them. And I felt like that was 
something that took longer than I thought it was going to take. Absolutely. And I see in the chat, 100% right on, spot on. Did uh, Jordan or? Yeah, I, th- oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, you know. I agree that you're, you're, um, they always say you're, you're switching one condition, biliary atresia, for another, being a transplant recipient, and it all happens in one day. So you are going from knowing what pre-transplant life is like and all of that medical knowledge to all of a sudden in 24 hours, you need to learn all of the medical knowledge of a post-transplant, all of the meds, all of the you know life changes. And so that's overwhelming. One thing I will say is that um, my son was transplanted before COVID. It was 2019. Um, so only a few months before COVID. And I don't know how I would have been able to do it without the support of people. Like the fact that we were able to have, you know, Robin McDonald House and social workers and because it really got locked down there for a while right after that. And I have, I am so thankful that um, I had the community and support because I think it would have been a thousand times more challenging to do it in isolation. Um, and I don't know how, I mean, I know families that got transplanted during that window and I um, do not envy them. Uh, so I think that on the on the flip side, what was the thing I was most thankful for post-transplant is that community was able to gather around me and, um, you know, support in all the ways that our loved ones are able to support. Um, you transplant so much later in life relative to other people uh, that have Billy and Trisha was really something. I mean, um, truthfully, I, I like growing up, I had a weird kind of person. I shouldn't say weird. Uh, I had a, a unique perspective and like, um, you know, we, you grow up knowing that you're going to have a transplant at some point being told that. And then after 18, I get to feel more invincible. Um, so when, um, uh, I guess my liver gave out on me, best way to describe it. Um, it was quick, uh, oftentimes painless. Uh, and, um, towards the end, of course, um, it, it became, uh, very trying and, you know, my became weaker and weaker. So post transplant was really tough. Um, and on top of that, you know, I, I working, I have a career, um, you know, kind of navigating that mental piece of it. Fortunately, didn't have kids, uh, forced, forced me, forced my hand to get married finally. Um, and, uh, it, it, the recovery process was really taxing. Um, it, it was uh, the hardest thing I've ever done as I think most folks who have had a transplant would describe it. Um, but just like how Kevin's been talking about parents have been graciously sharing their experience. It's, it's the people around you that get you through it. Um, and, and, uh, you get through it and, uh, by the grace of others and, and, uh, it certainly builds your character going forward. Um, and, uh, it's, um, a, a truly miraculous experience. Liz, I had a question. I couldn't find my hand raised. <laughs> oh, I'm so, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, Dr. Jorge has a really phenomenal question. So maybe you take his question first. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, actually, you know what? I might have to have you read that. My chat window is not acting oh, right. That's what I've been kind of fiddling with. And uh, so I'll have you read that for us. Absolutely, absolutely. For the parents. Do you think that discussing transplant early in the course is helpful or should pediatricians help parents focus on caring for the child with the disease and only talk transplant when the disease advances? So that could be for Liz or Jordan or Beth. I I think that it's, um, I mean, we need to kind of know all of the information of what it is going to look like down the road um and my son was trans because i was at 30 days and he was transplanted at 10 months he was listed at six months um and that felt like a really long time at the time but um 
not harping on like it too much, but I do think it just, it's an, it needs to be part of the conversation. Um, maybe I would feel differently if my son never needed a transplant or, um, you know, was still five years out from his side without one. Um, but since it ended up evolving so quickly, I feel like it would feel like you were withholding information as opposed to protecting like the moment. I think. I no, I, I agree with you, Beth. I, I, I think that that would be not necessarily like withholding. I kind of take the perspective that I think so much goes into and so much weight and hope goes into the Kasai. And as Dr. Sabrina talked about at the very beginning, the failure rate of a Kasai is so high. So I think that going in, I had for this window between diagnosis and the Kasai, I put so much into the results of that Kasai that that's really what I talked about. If as soon as, um, I, I don't know if that's denial, but it, I was so disappointed when the Kasai was considered a failure. And like, I almost grieved that. But at the same time, it's like, because of that, I think talking about transplant at the beginning would help kind of soften that blow to know that that is a realistic um, alternative. On the flip side, though, I'll say that at the time, there's a chance that they could have talked about transplant in in great, you know, great extent. And it could have gone in one ear and out the other. Like I might've had tunnel vision and I would like, and maybe it was me that just like focused on that Kasai and maybe it was my tunnel vision. So we just have to take that into account that even though maybe we mention it more so with parents, um, they might not be ready to hear it or they might not actually, they might hear it, but not, what, what is it? Not hear it, but listen or listen, but not hear it. You know what I'm trying to say. I think that we have to take that element into account. All right. And I'm going to, as a parent here, I'm going to just throw in that um, as the social worker, uh, as Kevin in the previous panel was discussing, learning each family individually, um, we got to the point where we didn't want to hear what was next in a way. It, and I don't, again, don't know if it was denial <laughs> or the fact that here we went from birth to eight weeks Kasai to Thanksgiving to Christmas to, oh gosh, six days on the waiting list for only the end of January at five months and two days, me to be on a table and be Alex's donor. So um, I know that luckily for us, St. Louis Children's and our team here at Children's, was phenomenal in that they kept trying to give us data and we were like, nope, 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 not today, not today, not going to listen, not going to hear it. So um, I, I think it really is a matter of learning your families and uh, helping, helping them as families, you know, cope just with the diagnosis in general and, and what it is they need when they need it. So yeah, thank you. And that's really good. Um, I did, uh, Liz, I wanted to ask the panel, any of you who have kids, multiple kids, and also Jenny and Jeffrey, if you have siblings. So we heard from Lexi talking about being a sibling of someone. How have you guys managed that um, as a parent if you have multiple kids? And Jenny and Jeffrey, um, if you have siblings, did they? Did you ever feel that they were treating you differently or just regular um, sibling love and a little sibling rivalry <laughs> as well? Mm, still to this day, I think my mother at 35 years old treats me a little different, um, which I think a lot of my life I've tried to, you know, shield her from, you know, what she endured when I had my transplant by excelling in areas that I had control over. Um, I definitely think it's impacted my siblings in certain ways, psychologically. Um, it's uh, challenging as um, a parent and a the society that we're in to juggle all of the priorities and manage a child with a chronic illness. Um, you know, it definitely straps for financial resources and many other things. And I, you know, I do believe that in some ways I had more attention because I, 
I needed it in different phases of my life. I needed to go, I had more one-on-one time. I had, um, you know, special treats when I went to lab, um, lab appointments. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that it has impacted them. And I think that's where, um, it's really important, uh, whatever tools you have in your tool belt to leverage them, whether it's through social worker or a family psychologist to, um, you know, come together and heal. Um, because at the end of the day, um, it, it, this is challenging. Um, having a transplant is very, uh, trying on a family unit. So, um, that's my take on it. <laughs> I think it would be very challenging to treat everyone as equals um, when we have such limited time and limited resources. Thank you. Did anybody else uh, have any other thoughts on on that? My son, uh, so my five-year-old has failure to treat and I have a two-year-old. So I feel like that's kind of the simple, It's all, it was a little more simple because I only had one kid. I didn't have to balance having this child at home while um, my son was being diagnosed. Um, and now it's, my two-year-old doesn't know, know any different. Um, so it's not really um, an issue in our house. I'm sure that as we get older, there'll be more discussions about it. We're very open about, um, you know, liver transplant and what Cal has been through. We have a little social story um, that we've made that has all pictures of Cal before his transplant and it kind of explains what happened. So um, as my two-year-old gets older, we read the story and um, that's kind of like a, an easy way for him to digest you know, just, you know, a bedtime story to him, but it's also, uh, you know, telling him what his older brother went through. So that was kind of, it was kind of simple, but I'm sure as Jenny said, inevitably, um, I'll, I'll treat them a little differently, but you treat all of your children differently for, you know, various reasons. So I don't, my, my situation is pretty simple, um, in that way. Great. Anyone else want to chime in? All right. I, um, uh, I will just really quickly somewhat answer that for us as well. We, at the time of Alex, had a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, and 14-year-old at home. And so uh, talk about siblings and how it affects siblings. And I mean, we had big siblings that were learning what it looked like to put a med pump together. And I mean, so it's amazing how it has changed the trajectory of our lives. Like, I would have never served on a national board like I had, it, and it wasn't a thing. I mean, I didn't have a purpose for that. And now I feel that I do. Uh, the other part of it is my daughter. So she was 10 at the time of transplant. She's uh, 27 years old now. She works at Mid-America Transplant as a organ procurement agent. And so she um, is super excited now that she gets to go and give people their livers and give people their lungs and their hearts. And so, um, Super proud of, of where the big kids have gone and how much uh, how much adversity that they had faced and how much they had to get past and over. Um, of course, Alex, being 10 years different, uh, is definitely not spoiled, not at all. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's rather interesting in that regard, too, because, uh, yeah, not spoiled, but spoiled. So... Uh, and I think the big kids are okay. They understand. They they work through it. They've lived through it. And um, it has really, truly changed the trajectory of all of our lives. So, yeah. All right. Well, with that, did anyone have any other questions? Let's take a look in the chat real quick. I think my chat might be working again. All right. I don't think I see any other questions. Um, I did have one question for Jeffrey and um, for Jenny. And that is, again, with, with talking about the siblings and whatnot, and um, just in general, uh, how did you work through peer pressure in high school? How did you work through, uh, you know, the 
any anybody just wanting you to go anywhere, do anything. I mean, because now it, it's one of those wild things that um, Alex is facing. So, you know, how how did you all manage and handle peer pressure being a biliary atresia patient? Um, I wasn't always perfect, but I stayed away from alcohol. <laughs> um, All right. And, you know, I think for me, what worked honestly is, um, you know, fortunate enough to have a really close group of friends that were kind of the outer ring, if you will. And, uh, going through college, um, I, I went far away from, for school from home. Um, and that was probably uh, not as much peer pressure in college as there is in high school or middle school, right. but that was kind of um, uh, what helped there. Like your accountability partners, if you will, you know, of, of like you had to party at college or high school when someone goes to hand you a drink, they grab it, you know, and <laughs> little things like that where, um, it's not easy, um, but, uh, you know, fortunately, you, for me, uh, I was made aware of uh, the decisions that you would be faced with, uh, the, the consequences of if you made them, uh, and, and how to potentially avoid them, I guess, is the best way to say it. But... Very yeah. good. So uh, for me, I was transplanted as a baby. I don't have any recollection of being ill or anything really related to my transplant outside the fact that I had a giant scar and, you know, just had to do, um, you know, go to clinic once a year. Um, I was really fortunate. Um, I believe the best thing that somebody can do as they're entering that phase of their life is to have um, a strong connection to their medical team um, and have a really good plan for transition um, to really lay out um, a roadmap for um, what whatever your course was, whether it was complicated or, or easy, um, what those consequences look like and what impacts they can have on your long-term health. Um, I certainly would have um, in, appreciated a little bit more education around that um, however, um, at, at this phase of my life, um, I make sure that I'm a very, very compliant and I'm a really big advocate for, um, you know, no alcohol, staying hundred percent on track. Um, and, uh, for that reason, you know, I feel really fortunate that, you know, my liver is, um, you know, lasted for 35 years. So, um, I think also, um, having a mentor or having somebody that you can talk to about the pressures of, um, being a young adult, cause they're not going to go away. Um, so is really, really important. And I like the idea of an accountability partner. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. All right. Well, thank you. And with that, I think we are coming to time. So I'm going to thank Jeffrey, Jenny, Beth, Jordan. Thank you. I truly appreciate your stories. And um, like my own, we are definitely on a journey. So, and uh, we always at my house talk about enjoying the adventure as we're going along for the ride. So, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate you joining tonight. And I'll turn this over. Thank you so much. That was so amazing. Liz, thank you for moderating. And I think we have a special little guest from Cal right there. So thank you for Say showing bye. up. <laughs> Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Danny. <laughs> to close off, we are going to show our animated video we have for kids. This is new to our website this year, and it's a great resource for your kid who is sick, your children that aren't sick or maybe some friends or classmates so i just want to share this real quick so you guys get a glimpse of what we have to offer hi my name is maya and i'm here to tell you about my liver we all have organs inside our bodies like the heart that pumps blood the lungs which pump air and the liver that helps digest food and protect us from germs the liver is located on the right side just above your tummy. 
It's like a little factory that helps us stay healthy and strong. When you're a kid, the liver is about the size of an apple. But by the time you're a grown-up, it's your largest organ and about the size of a football. My parents told me that when I was a baby, the doctor discovered that my liver wasn't working like it was supposed to. They said this was called biliary atresia, or BA for short. BA is a rare liver disease that only affects newborns. My liver was blocked and I couldn't digest food. This caused my skin and eyes to turn yellow. I was sleeping more than normal and my stomach was very upset. Blech! There is no cure for BA, but thankfully, in my case, I was able to have a special surgery to unblock my liver so that it could connect to my tummy and other organs. Everyone was so happy that my liver procedure was a success. After the surgery, my parents made sure I ate a healthy diet. And as I got older, I began taking vitamins with my meals. The healthier I eat and drink, the easier it is for my liver to keep me strong. I still have liver checkups often. And one day, I might even need a new liver. But so far, so good. Now I'm strong enough to do all the things my friends can do. For more information about biliary atresia, go to liverfoundation.org. So that's just a little bit of what we have in our BA Pediatric Liver Center on our website. And now I would like to welcome Ivory, our National Director of Community Impact, just to speak shortly about some BA plans for 2024. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I am so excited that you were able to see this video. This video is located on liverfoundation.org under our new Pediatric Information Center, which is amazing. We are so proud of it and so excited to now have this um, space for all parents, as well as family members and children to go on to find out more information. We have a section for parents. We have a section for teens and young adults and kids a video library, so much information for all of you. In 2024, we're gonna have some new things coming out and we're so excited for it. Um, some new little brave items um, for parents and kids, um, some items for parents to potentially read with their kids. Um, so you have to stay tuned following us on our BA Facebook page, as well as our other social media accounts and continue to follow us for more updates on what's gonna be happening new. You do not want to miss what's happening in 2024. And I would like to now turn it over for closing to our wonderful program coordinator for all of her work on putting this together, Casey. Thank you. So I just want to thank all of our presenters and our moderators again for joining us today and providing such an impactful and informative presentation. I would also like to shout out to Yancy Espinoza, Lindsay Westerndorf, and Dawn Carr. Sarah Naro, who shared these adorable photos in our Facebook support group of their BA champions. And if you would like to join our Facebook group, Life with Biliary Atresia and Beyond American Liver Foundation support group, please follow the link that we're going to put in the chat. It is a private group to share stories, ask questions, and find a community of people who are facing the same challenges and triumphs as, as you. If anyone has any additional questions after today's presentation, please continue this conversation in that Facebook group. And if you have any specific questions regarding, regarding this topic, please send them to me and we can work on getting them answered for you. For questions about liver wellness and disease or for emotional support to patients at the point of crisis and information on local resources, including physician referrals, please contact our helpline at 1-800-GO-LIVER or 1-800-465-4837. Our staff is ready to assist you Monday through Friday from nine to five Eastern Standard Time. And that is all we have time for for today. So thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your night.